Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, welcome at the French Institute for this new evening of the Beyond Worlds Festival. I invite you to check our program for there are many others uh, fantastic events until the end of the week, uh, especially a fascinating and most anticipated discussion about France's colonial past with Eric Vuillard and Natalia Benhalet Vince on Thursday. Uh, also invite you, invite those of you who like European literature to check the European Writers Festival, which we organize with Unic London and the Europe, European Literature Network <coughs> excuse me, at the British Library. But tonight we are delighted to partner uh, with one of the finest independent British publishers of translated literature, Jane Etkin and her wonderful team at Gallic Books. Gallic Books launched 15 years ago with a mission to publish the very best of French into English and have since gained a reputation for championing books that are brilliant, unique and always enjoyable. Together we are delighted to showcase three of the most exciting and successful authors from their pool. Muriel Barbery was born in Casablanca, Morocco. She is the author of six novels, including the multi-million copy bestseller The Elegance of the Hedgehog, she has lived in Kyoto, Amsterdam, Paris, and now lives in the French countryside. And her latest book published in the UK, A Single Rose, over there, translated into English by Alison Anderson, is a moving tale inspired by the author's Nippon adventures on grief and blossoming love. Jean-Baptiste Andrea is a novelist, film director, and screenwriter. His debut novel, Marraine, won 12 literary prizes in France, including the Prix du Premier Roman and the Prix Femina des Lycéens. And his most recent novel, Devils and Saints, translated into English by Sam Taylor, won the Grand Prix RTL Lire in 2021. And Antoine Lorrain is the best-selling author of eight novels, including The Red Notebook and The President's Hat, his books have been translated into 25 languages and sold more than 200 copies in English. His latest book is An Astronomer in Love. It's translated into English by Louise Rogers Lallory and Megan Jones. And the three of them will be in conversation with Viv Goskop. Viv is a versatile writer, stand-up comedian and playwright. She is a regular contributor to top publications like The Financial Times, The Guardian and The Observer. And her books include Au Revoir Tristesse, Lessons in Happiness from French Literature, and the Anna Karenina Fix, Life Lessons from Russian, Russian Literature. And tonight there will be some readings by Félicité du Jeu, known for a recurring part in the BBC Walking the Dead. Félicité's career has ranged from playing Catherine in Henry V at the National Theatre to acting in films such as Casino Royale and Munich. She's also, she has also wrote and produced her first play, Spiked, at the Pleasance Theatre in 2018. And before we start, I'd like to give the floor to Joe Harper from Gallic Books. Thank you very much, Matthias, and of course to the French Institute for hosting what promises to be a brilliant evening of conversation. Um, I'm very conscious that this is not the bit of the evening that we are, we are here for, but it seems right to take a moment to very briefly introduce or to reintroduce Gallic books. Um, as Matthias has said, we were founded a little over 15 years ago with a unique mission to publish the very best of what the French were actually reading in France, a lot of which never seemed to make the very short hop over the channel. Whilst we now also publish English language, uh, originated books too, with some significant successes. That original focus on French books has remained a central tenet of our publishing, and it is, after all, in, in our name. Um, over the past decade and a half, we've brought over 100 books to, to English readers, including the brilliant work of the, the three authors we'll be hearing from tonight. They sit in our list alongside names such as André Gide, Pascal Garnier, and even Napoleon. Uh, 
series such as Revolutionary Women have allowed us to bring forgotten classics of French culture to, to the public consciousness, this side of the channel. And we remain the, the first choice for French publishers of contemporary bestsellers. I think we can pretty confidently say that this has been a resounding success. And we've proven that there is an appetite for French translations in England. All of this is set to continue. Most notably and imminently, we have uh, Antoine's an Astronomer in Love, which will be published at the end of uh, next month, although we do have early copies downstairs in the foyer with, from Dave and, uh, Dave and his team. Um, and uh, Muriel's latest novel, uh, A Fervent Hour, I think it is current working title, um, will be published in the spring of 2024. Other, other names from, uh, from French, France and French culture will be coming to our list shortly, including, uh, including the world's most Michelin-starred chef, Alain Ducasse, whose uh, memoir we'll be publishing later this year. None of this would be possible, of course, without, without support. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank a few people as, as part of this celebration of Gallic books tonight. The French Institute has been a huge support throughout our programme over the years. And thanks also go to our, to our owner and founder, Jane, Jane Aitken, who launched Gallic's mission. Books without readers are, of course, are of course as nothing, and so huge thanks go to our readers and to the press, many of whom are here tonight, who have spread the word both about our books particularly, but also the wider landscape of translated fiction that allows us to thrive in the UK landscape of books. Um, but for tonight, the greatest thanks, of course, are due to our authors, and most especially Antoine, Muriel and Jean-Baptiste, already thoroughly introduced and thanks to you for joining us tonight. And with that, I'll pass you over to, to Viv, and I look forward to what we're about to hear. Thank you so much. We have a round of applause for Joe and Mathias. And let us welcome Antoine Laurent, Muriel Barberi, and Jean-Baptiste Andrea. And welcome to all of you. Uh, thank you so much for those lovely introductions. I feel as if you've already done like 99% of my job. <laughs> thank you. Et merci énormément à vous, à vous d'être là. Um, I feel as uh, the only English person on the panel, I should speak some French, um, <laughs> especially in the post-Brexit <laughs> context. Um, welcome so much to all of you. Thank you for being here. This evening has been billed as a Gallic evening. Uh, to which my husband immediately says, d said, does that mean that they will be serving Gallic bread? Uh, which I thought was very appropriate. No Gallic bread, but I wonder if we can use this evening to ask a question about what it means to be French, what it means to be a French author. Is this a stupid question? Uh, it's often a big mistake when you have an event like this with multiple authors to draw comparisons between them and to find the, the points in common. And of course, it's very facile uh, to suggest that just because you are French and you are an author, that you have anything in common. Um, we're also going to be able to hear some beautiful extracts um, read by Félicité Dujeu um, from each of these three books. So through the course of this evening, we'll be in conversation. We will hear an extract from each of the books. Then we'll have the last part of this evening where you'll have a chance to put your questions uh, to the author, give us your comments, give us your ideas about what does Frenchness mean uh, in literature, what, what is the state of French literature, and then afterwards, um, at around 8 o'clock when we finish, you'll have the opportunity to come and meet the authors, buy as many books as you possibly can, and have your copies signed. Um, but Antoine, I was wondering if you could uh, kick us off by telling us if the three of you already have a relationship. Do you know each other? Is it common for you to do an event like this? We, uh, we love cats and dogs. <laughs> so that's, that's a very good point. Uh, but in fact, to, to make a, 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 this is a very serious answer because it's very important to love cats and, and dog. And, uh, but uh, no, in fact, it's, uh, it's the first time I met Muriel and, uh, and Jean-Baptiste, yeah. Uh, so we are, uh, we are all in the, at the same publisher. So it's a, very, it's a very good link for us 
to be at Garlic Book because in France we are we have different publishers, of course. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's uh, it's a very good team, Garlic. Yeah, mm. hello, Jen. Uh, Jean Baptiste, is it uh, a common occurrence for you to come to meet your anglophone readers? Does this happen often? Um, yeah, good evening. Um, it's m the first time for me. Um, I, I used to live in London, but I wasn't a writer at the time, at least not in the field of literature. I was a, a, a screenwriter at the time. Um, but And we do tour a lot in France and abroad a bit more rarely. It happens, but for me it's the first time, so it's very... Uh, it's great. Mm. And Muriel, I'm very thrilled to be in conversation with you for the second time because we met already at Oxford Literary Festival. Do you enjoy these kind of events? I know it's always very difficult for authors to bridge that gap between the solitude that is necessary for your work and the very public nature of these moments. Well, good evening. It's very uncomfortable for me to confess that I don't like that very <laughs> much. But it's not completely true because in the end I find quite a lot of satisfaction because we don't have opportunities to talk about our work. We cannot talk with ourselves. We write in solitude, but to elaborate about what we did and to be able to put it into words, it happens in such cases. So I try to overcome my shyness by thinking that in the end I would be happy to have been able to articulate things that alone I could not articulate about not what's in the books, but the way I, I work, and this is, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. We learn things about ourselves, it's like free therapy. <laughs> That's true. You'll get the bill at the end, <laughs> if it's good therapy. I wasn't told. <laughs> it, only, it only works if you pay, so I guess. Yeah. So. <laughs> Very good. Well, yeah, I want to get into later this evening into your process, um, how you spend your time, how these books are created. You are all incredibly prolific authors. That is one thing you have in common. But let's kick off with um, one of uh, with our first extract, which comes from Antoine Laurent's An Astronomer in Love. Let's hand over and give a round of applause to Félicité Dujeu. On the 26th of March, 1760, Guillaume Joseph Hyacinthe Jean-Baptiste Le Gentil de la Galésière, astronomer to the Académie Royale des Sciences, boarded the 50-gun ship Le Berrier in the French port of Lorient, bound for India. As the naval vessel put to sea, he just about managed to cling to the mast his silver buckled patent leather shoes had almost caused him to lose his footing on the slippery deck. A stiff Breton gale whipped his blue frock coat and lace jabot, and he pressed his right hand firmly to the crown of his three-cornered black felt hat. The start of a long and perilous voyage. When a man set sail to journey halfway around the globe, there was no knowing in those days whether he would be seen alive again. Guillaume Le Gentil was traveling on the orders of His Majesty Louis XV, charged with a precise mission for which he was most uniquely qualified, to measure with the aid of his telescopes and astronomical instruments the true rather than the supposed distance from the Earth to the Sun on the occasion of the transit of Venus across our star. The small planet named for the goddess of love took an unusual sequence of turns across the Sun's disk, to say the least. One passage was followed by a second eight years later, after which a whole 122 years would pass before the next. Then another eight year interval, but after that, it would be 105 years until another transit could be observed. The alternating sequence of eight, 122 and 105 <coughs> years was unchanged since the creation of the universe itself. Guillaume Le Gentil had taken every care not 
to miss the exceptional observation he would make from Pondichéry on the 6th of June, 1761, more than a year after his departure from France, thanks to which he might, perhaps, become the first man to measure the true distance between the earth and the star that is the source of all its light. Everything was prepared down to the last detail, and yet nothing whatsoever would go as planned. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much, Felicité. Antoine, how does it feel to hear your words spoken in English? Is it strange? Well, it's always the same feeling, in fact. It seems, it seems uh, it's, it's very well ri written by, uh, by someone else than me. So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I have very good translator, so, so that's, that's the best. But it's, it's always very, very, very bizarre to hear that, yes. And when you hear those words, do you think, oh, I could have written that bit differently? I've always heard writers reading from their own work and I've even seen them correct it before they read from it when it's already published. No, because it's always much more better in English than in French. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, I know it's the French Institute here. But, uh, well, uh, it's interesting to see the translation from the French into English because uh, um, my books are, are much more thin in English than in French. But mm. in fact, it's exactly the same. So it's mm. like a, it's like magic. It's a hocus pocus. Mm. It's because in French you're very verbose. French people speak a lot. We're very concise. No, it's because we don't. You that have more true. words. So there's a word, for example, in France we can't say fluffy. It's. I'm still looking for the translation in fluffy. 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 Anybody in the room? There isn't one word fluffy? in French to say fluffy. Very true. So we will have to make a long sentence to explain what it means. So yeah. that's why the books slim down, because you have the exact, precise word to say something. How would you say fluffy? How you, would you, you don't. You just we say this. No fluffy. No. We don't say fluffy. fluffy. We, just, we just try to skirt yeah. around it, and we don't say it. Yeah. yeah we, need, we need to vote at the p French Parliament to have a fluffy word. Yeah. <laughs> Fluffer. Yeah. Fluffer. Well, Fluffer. we usually keep the English word when yeah. that happens. Fluffy. Okay. Yeah, that's fascinating. We should also note that this extract, in some ways, is a deception uh, as an idea for what this book is, because this is a book that is very much told in two parts. And Guillaume Le Gentil, I'm very grateful that you were the one who had to say his full name. <laughs> Felicité, it's a very long name. Uh, Guillaume Le Gentil is only half of this book. So this book begins with his journey tracking this star in 1760. And then the other half of the story is told through the eyes of Xavier, an estate agent uh, in Paris, who inherits uh, Le Gentil's telescope. Tell us more about how those two parts of the story came about. Is that a common trope that you use in your writing, that you have two stories interwoven? No, it's the, it's the first time. Uh, it's, it's, it's the first time I have decided to do that. Because, in fact, uh, just at the beginning, uh, it was, I think, six or seven years ago, I've read in a magazine a little, a, a small, very small paper about the story of Guillaume Le Gentil. And I thought that the story of that astronomer who is uh, he's looking for the, the Venus transit and, uh, and it's impossible for him to, to get it. But I, 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 it's impossible to say the end of the book because <laughs> you won't buy it after. <laughs> and uh, that um, I was really fascinated by this, this story and this man. And I thought it could be a character in a book, but I, I didn't want to write a full book, uh, I mean an historical book, uh, only set in the French 18th century. So it's, it stayed like a post-it near my, near my desk during years and years and years. And at some point one day, I thought maybe there is two stories, two guys. One guy in love with a woman, he looks through the telescope by Guillaume Le Gentil and he's a little bit shy, he, he, he doesn't want to cross the street to talk to her. 
And, uh, and the other story, it's the real story of the astronomer. And maybe I could mix the two stories. One chapter in the, in the 18th century, another chapter, no. And so on, and so on, and so on. And so that's the, that's the mm. construction of the astronomer. I have to confess that I fell in love a little bit with Xavier, the slightly hopeless estate agent who likes <coughs> eating olive oil on toast. Uh, he's a very sweet, romantic, gentle character. Yeah, uh, like me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, okay, I can see. Is that some, you know, this is, you've already answered a question that um, we were joking earlier about how the questions that authors hate to be asked and that I would always ask um, as an interviewer and you're all French so you all have to say buff in response to all of the questions. But the, you already answered a question that often writers don't want to ask, which is, where did you get the idea for this book? And it's interesting to think that you have this post-it that sits there maybe for years and years, and there must be other post-its that are completely ignored. Um, tell me, Muriel, how would you know when you have that kind of post-it moment uh, how do you know when an idea is going to become a book or when an idea is right? Um, I asked Margaret Atwood this question recently and she said that it's like having a piece of material if you're a, a dress designer or you're making a dress. You have to allow the material to expand in your mind so you know how, if you have enough to make a short story, a novel, so how do you know when that post-it is kind of ready? I feel bad because I don't have any post-it. Mm -hmm. And I don't write with ideas, so I feel a bit embarrassed. Uh, I don't know how to answer your question because I, I'm wondering how does it start? And it's the most difficult question, how does it start when you start a novel? I think it starts with images and with the intuition of a structure, of a shape short, lyrical, poetic, or on the contrary, dry, fast, uh, and, and that's it. And then I have uh, days of despair, trying to understand how to do, how to make novel of it. So it's, it's quite chaotic, actually. When do you know that this idea is working or does that moment never come? It's, but it's not an idea, that's the problem. So I feel that I'm maybe not at the right place. Because, uh, how can I explain that? When I start a novel, usually I see a color or an atmosphere, a sort of, uh, of uh, mm, patchwork of images, of sounds, of colors, and and... And then it becomes a character, and then this character leads me to a story. Probably this is this way, but if it could be that simple, my early mornings would be way easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's always good to know that there is no right way <laughs> to do this. No, and it's different. I don't know for, for my colleagues, but it, it's different each time. At my age, I would love to think that it will get easier and that my experience will help me coping with the new novel in, in, in an easier way. It doesn't. Mm. It's, it, it, I think it's even harder with time. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with, with Muriel, with, with the, the question of the, the process, years after years, books after books. In fact, no, it's not at all easier it seems that it's always the first time. I mean, just, just for me, it's always the first time. And it's even more, uh, it's harder because I think we are more ambitious in the sense of we, 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 we want to reach higher, something higher, and, uh, and we are more aware of our weaknesses and of everything we can't do the way we would like to do. So it's, it's a difficult job. Mm. Jean-Baptiste, how does it compare for you, especially because you started your writing career as a screenwriter, which must be a completely different discipline? How did you move from that into writing um, a novel? Well, I moved out of, of the film industry uh, out of frustration because I was I got fed up having to write, uh, always wondering. There was always there were always filters. How much is that going to cost? Who's the audience? 
and I didn't want that anymore. I wanted to be free. So it was a beautiful school for me. It taught me a lot. Uh, you know, like you can go from here to there and here to there, and you learn a lot from those boundaries. But I really felt I got very frustrated at some point. Actually, I had sent a project to, uh, I think it was Netflix, and they said, we love it, but it's too original. And I, I, I had a personal crisis, really, for the first time in my life, thinking, so tomorrow I'm going to have to wake up. We do a hard job, as in, you know, every time you have to start from, uh, from scratch. And, uh, and, and on top of that, tomorrow I'm going to have to think, is this too original, new filter? And that's horrible. <laughs> At least I was able to get up in the morning and do what I wanted to do um, up to that point. So that's how my first novel came about. It suddenly I had been thinking about it for four years, and it came out in a burst, right two weeks after, after the, that crisis. And as for how you know, it's really like, I mean, you observe the world and kind of looking for ideas. I fully agree. I have the same thing every time you feel like it's the first time and you don't know how to do it. Every time you have no idea how you did it before. Mm -hmm. And yet you did it, so it's very strange. And you don't know if you're ever going to be able to do it again. And so you have ideas, you know, it could be, I'm more, I, I mean, I don't physically have post-its there in my mind. And I reviews, review ideas and people all the time. I stare at people on the tube, which is not something one has to do, especially in England. I, I read that <laughs> in a book. Um, and then suddenly you fall in love. It's like falling in love. You don't know why. You don't know but you know when it happens. And there's suddenly an idea which seems to you the most appealing and most beautiful of all, all the ideas that you've ever had. Mm -hmm. And that's when I write. Mm -hmm. But I can't explain it, you know, no more than Antoine or Muriel. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, it's very personal. Mm. This process sounds like a mixture, and maybe this is a French mixture, you can discuss, of something very joyful, inspiring, um, mysterious, and also something very dark and depressing. I mean, I can see the torture in all of your eyes when you <laughs> talk about this. It does sound this very curious mixture of, of something very beautiful that, of course, you would want to devote your life to, but something that is also very painful. Well, in fact, I think it looks like the life. Oh, that's the most French no, response but, but ever. No, but everybody has that in there. You know, you wake up in the morning and sometimes it's the hardest thing and sometimes it's great. I, I think we'd love to say it's just us because we're writers, you know, make it a bit more romantic and all about us. But I think it's pretty much what everybody goes through. Mm. It's just, uh, just more lonely probably for us. Mm. I wouldn't say painful or depressing, not at all, but difficult, yes. And what I usually tell my colleagues when we call each other to say how desperate we are and nothing's working and we're sure that it won't work and, and we are really bad, is that over the years I learned how to like this battle, which is inner battle. We are battling, struggling against ourselves and it's not painful, it's, uh, it's challenging, difficult, but I, I, I'm not suffering when I'm writing. You just say you call your friends to say how desperate you are. Yes, but so I'm not in the that end. That sounds painful to me. <laughs> yes, but no, I understand. Uh, yeah, this is a yeah. plaintive way of French yes. people to complain about yes. everything, of course. We do that with talent as well. Yeah, that, that's true. It's, uh, I think um, I agree with, with Muriel. And, uh, it's the second so time. Yeah, 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 it's the second time. You're going to be we able to call each other to <laughs> complain <laughs> about writing. We should have the same publisher. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah, we should. Uh, yeah, it's not painful. It's not painful. I think that we, which could be very difficult. It's when you you can listen the silence you have inside you. You know, when you have no idea, when you 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 you're not uh, you're not involved in the story, and you have days like that. So one day, one is possible. Two, three, four. It's you 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 feel very worried. It's not painful. No, it's, uh, it's, it's risky. And I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I do. It's worrying because what I find the most frustrating, and that would be probably the term, some days are really frustrating, some days are really frustrating, it's when I see the gap between what I would like to do and what comes out of my pen, which is very different each time and which will be forever. So that's the frustrating part. You agree? I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> and 
I think when they're a famous duo in France. Yeah, we're, we're yeah, they, they go we around France. Always agree with each other. It's Many funny duet. <laughs> and um, when when the book is finished, if it looks like a little bit the the first idea you had of what it could be, I think it's pretty good. Yes, it's pretty good. Ah, you agree. Yeah, well, this is a, a famous idea amongst writers that the book inside your head never resembles the same book that results. Well, I have to disagree. My pain is precisely to work on making it resemble, and that's why it takes me forever to do it. That's why I find it really painful. I d uh, my difficult days are not, not having any ideas, is to find the right way to express an idea, but and I, I don't know how many books I write because I want them all to look like the one I have in my head. So it's a slightly different thing. But we have two schools of writing basically and I have a lot of fights with, you know, are you uh, writing like just starting where an idea is going to take you or prepare and plan a lot, which I do, so that will lead to a different way of working and anguish but at different moments. Yeah, so your style is to plan. I plan a lot. I plan for 10 months and then I write and I don't stop for four months, basically. Right. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, yes. You agree? I'm trying to convert. That's not what you do. You no. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to convert all my friends to my way of working, but it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is your objective? Well... I, I read a lot of novels, which I think not these guys, because I've read them and I really, they're, they're, this is a tight structure, they're both storytellers, but I, I, I find a lot of books published in France do not manage to tell a story and they shine through style, uh -huh. but they lack that basic thing which makes us open a book, they can't tell, I mean, a lot of them don't tell me a story. And I tell a lot of people who said, oh, I started my books, they took me over there and look, I'm published, it's great, and I'm, I'm thinking, sometimes I don't say it, but I'm thinking, yeah, but it would be better had you planned a bit. Um, that's all. So that's mm. why I'm trying to change mm. the world. More post-its. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, more post-its, exactly. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question of... Sorry. Yeah. No, it's a question of structure, I think. Exactly. Yeah. A, a lot of books, a lot of novels in France have no structure. So you need, to, you need a structure. You need a, a, a beginning, you need a middle, and you need a hand. And so you are converted, so actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very surprised, really. Yeah. I'm going to break up their duet. Yeah. Antoine, there's we should talk together. There's now a rupture. That's a rupture. True. But it's true that in French, we don't have the... I, I think we don't have this difference that you make in English between storyteller and writer. And it is true as well that some of us are more interested in writing or in storytelling. And you can see that when you read a book. And some genius are both. Mm. Yeah. There shouldn't be a difference. I mean, we, we write to tell stories, don't we? No, I disagree. Okay. I don't think so. It well, it a single rose tells a story. Yeah, but what I want is to, to make sentences, to use language. And it happens that it leads me to story. But this okay, is not but my main does. purpose. Yeah, I understand. Mm. Very good. Let's have another extract. This is from a book which really examines to extremes comedy, tragedy, darkness, light. Uh, let's hear from Jean-Baptiste Andrea, Devils and Saints. Please give a round of applause again for Felicité Dumont. <laughs> You know me. Just think, and you'll remember. The old man who plays those public pianos that you see in various transport hubs. On Thursday, I'm at Orly, and on Fridays, at Charles de Gaulle. The rest of the week, I play in train stations, other airports, anywhere I can find a piano. I can often be found at the Gare de Lyon because I live nearby. You have probably heard me more than once before. One day, at last, you come closer. If you are a man, you won't say anything. 
You will pretend to tie your laces so that you can listen to me without it being obvious. If you are a woman, I will probably look a little startled because I am waiting for a woman. Don't worry, it's not you. I have been waiting for her for more than 50 years. You have a thousand faces. I remember each of them. I forget nothing. You are that girl on pale mornings bouncing back and forth between the city and the suburbs. You are that man in a dark suit about whom I remember thinking, I bet he makes love with the zeal of a bureaucrat. Even if, obviously, this is none of my business. I am the first to acknowledge that women are a complicated matter. You are white, you are blue, red, green. You are all the colors of the rainbow. You wander around my pianos looking lost because I am not asking for money. Then you approach me. You all ask me the same question. What's a man like you doing in a place like this? What does that mean, I ask, a man like me? And you always answer in more or less the same way. A well-groomed man like you, even if you missed part of your left cheek when you shaved this morning. A well-dressed man like you, even if your tie is a bit old-fashioned. A man, basically, who can play the piano like you can. You play like a god. Perhaps you play for him. A talent like yours should not be wasted in train stations or airports. You play like those pianists who enchant audiences all over the world in the great concert halls. But here, you are only enchanting the wet tarmac in some rain-drenched hats. You're right, madam. Very perspicacious of you, sir. My concert venues have terrible acoustics and they smell of metal tracks and jet fuels. My scholars and Carnegie Halls have names like Montparnasse, Roissy, Union Station, John F. Kennedy Airport, and there is a good reason for that, but it is a long story and I don't want to bore you. You go on your way, most of you, Occasionally, you do not give up. You offer me a large sum of money to play for your mother on her birthday at a dinner party, a bar mitzvah, and you see me hesitate. You suggest introducing me to your husband, a senior manager at the Philharmonie de Paris, or your uncle, who's a talent agent for musician. Each time, I decline politely. Thank you, truly. It was very kind of you to offer. I would make a very poor guest. The only places I like are wide open spaces with gusts of wind and slamming doors. Yesterday you asked me, will you be here tomorrow? Tomorrow is neither Thursday nor Friday. So yes, of course, I'll be here. Thank you, Felicite. That was beautiful. Again, a slightly deceptive extract. Um, that's the opening, very cinematic, powerful opening, drawing us into this world of this man, Joe, Joseph, who we are meeting in his late 60s, right, when he is always playing the piano in these public places, waiting, waiting, waiting for someone to come. And then we move very quickly to... It's almost like a telescopic moment that we see his childhood immediately. Explain to us what happens directly after that passage. Um, well, he explains that he, um, <coughs> he got sick, which is a metaphor actually for him. He actually became an orphan very young, at a very young age. And he was a privileged child from a wealthy family and he was sent to an orphanage and to really 
dark, uh, horror movie-like place in the Pyrenees. And so he loses all landmarks and everything he knows and he's, it's ba basically like being sent to another planet. He actually says, I was sent to the moon. And he has to relearn life and, uh, you know, it's a book about, it's a lot about music and it's about how this mediocre musician grumbling when he had to go to piano classes becomes, finally hears what his teacher was trying to uh, make him hear, genius, and he has to go, but he has to go through a very, very dark tunnel before he gets there. Very dark, but full of humor, don't worry. Yeah, but it I'm is I'm full I'm of humor. Mm, yeah. mm. And it has, for me, you know, as an a Anglophone reader, uh, an atmosphere of boarding school, you know, that very kind of repressed uh, English idea, but through the lens of uh, religion, and it also has a flavor of Lord of the Flies. You know, this is a, a book about the brutality of children as well as the cruelty of adults towards children. Yeah, and it was more exotic in France because we don't have a system of boarding school, or we used to, but it's already bringing up images of the 60s for us. But the, the book was partially inspired by my meeting a reader in a, in a book fair in Grenoble who told me about his growing up in an orphanage in the mountains near Grenoble, an, orf an orphanage which is very soon going to be in the news in France now because they are finally suing the, the state and the church and now. Uh, and it was not about sexual abuse, there's none of that in the book, it was about a form of violence. I realized when, as he was talking to me, that the worst form of violence, and that's why I, I use in that book, that's, that's, is the absence of love. I mean, of course, physical violence is something. But I thought the total absence of love was the most brutal thing you can do to a child. Who g they, they, they had ch children as, uh, as, as young as five-year-olds uh, in, in this orphanage. And just there was m mental cruelty, really. It was a religious uh, orphanage. Um, and I thought, okay, how am I going to tell that story? I, always, I don't like to talk about depressing things. I didn't want the book to be depressing, so I, I blended it. I wanted to write with music. It was my post-it, like Antoine said. I had a post-it. I'm trying to write about music. I love music. And this, both these, of these stories blended. So I was, I, you know, it, it is a bit Dickensian somehow, uh, the figure of the orphan. Um, well, that's how it happened. Mm. And did this, the writing of this book follow the same process as you mentioned for your first book, mm. a yeah. long planning, very intense, short writing period? Yes, mm -hmm. they will have the same process. Um, um, and actually, after meeting Gérard, I, I, his name is on the last page of the book, I thought, what am I going to do? I love uh, fiction, I love making up stories, I can't write a story about him, I don't, you know, I don't even want to, but this... I want to somehow, the, the idea stayed with me for two years and one morning I was promoting my second book and I was in Clermont-Ferrand and you know, you kind of tour France and you wake up and like, where am I? Oh, Clermont-Ferrand, I was seven in the morning, I was going to another place, I was in the station and there was a young guy, actually not a, probably 17, it was him and me and another guy in the hall in the, in the st of the station and he starts playing Beethoven. Suddenly it hits me okay, this is the story, this is how I'm going to write about music and how I'm going to do justice to that story that was passed on to me. And I started writing on a little piece of paper I had in my pocket and I came home and I, I, I did my usual thing, one more, a few months of structure and then writing. Mm. But it was clear, suddenly, I had it. Mm. Because it was, things were falling into place, had been falling into place without me being conscious of it for the past two years. Mm. Uh, Antoine, Jean-Baptiste mentioned there the idea that for example, boarding school environment is not particularly familiar for a French audience. Thinking about this idea I, I introduced at the beginning of what makes a book French, what makes an author French, what makes a story French, is that a stupid thing to think about? Is it something you would ever think about in your writing of who is this for, will they understand the references? Or is it always just led by the stories and the characters? It's a very good question. Do you have six hours? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, well, in, in fact, I, I could say that uh, when The President's Heart was published uh, in, uh, in the UK, 
and I was very surprised by the success because for me it was a very French story. Uh, talking about the President Mitterrand during, uh, who lost his hat during the 80s with many references at the TV program or, or, or music, pop music, very French pop music uh, during those years. So I, I thought that was very, very French for a French audience and in fact it wasn't at all. It was more, much more universal than, than I thought. And uh, even in the in the USA, I remember some readers. They were very very huge fan of the book, but they discovered the when during a meeting that they, like we we are, we are doing right now that the president meeting was a real character. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, this is this is magical moments of the of the translation and the story. So this I think the story belongs to us, belongs to the to the writer at, at, the s at some point, but mainly their <coughs> stories are, 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 are sometimes and very often more universal. In fact, the story exists uh, in, in itself. Mm. Uh, Muriel, we'll hear in a moment an extract from A Single Rose, which is very much immersed in the world of Japanese <laughs> culture. But does this question of Frenchness ever come up for you? I'm thinking in particular of the elegance of the hedgehog and its references to philosophy, which is always a theme which is owned by the French, if you like. Or is it for you something that's just abstract and not relevant? Not relevant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not relevant at all, because when I write, I don't think of readers at all. I write how I can and the best I can. And then after I... I receive with pleasure or disappointment the reactions of readers, <laughs> but uh, I, this is not a question I'm asking myself. And when I was uh, young, when I was reading ferociously uh, with the passion of a young age, I was reading writers from all culture, from all languages, and I loved it, so I never asked myself that question. Mm. Let's hear then from um, A Single Rose by Muriel Barbary a really beautiful novel set in Kyoto. Please give a round of applause for Felicité Dusha. The evening came back to her in waves. The airport, the long drive through the night, the arrival, the lantern-lit garden, the woman in a kimono kneeling on the raised floor. To the left of the sliding door through which she had come, branches of summer magnolia spilled from a dark vase and caught the light in successive cascades. The shadows on the walls flickered like gleaming water pouring onto the flowers, and all around there was a strange quivering darkness. Rose could make out walls with sand finishes flat stones leading to the raised flooring, secret spirits, an entire twilight life suffused with sighs. The Japanese woman had led her to her room. In the next room, steam for a bath rose from a large basin made of smooth wood. Rose had slid into the scalding water captivated by the bare simplicity of this damp, silent crypt, its wooded decor, its pure lines. When she stepped out of the bath, she wrapped herself in a light cotton kimono, the way one might enter a sanctuary. Similarly, she slipped into the sheets with an inexplicable sentiment of fervor then everything faded away. Now there came a discreet knock and the door slid open with a soft scraping sound. The woman from the night before came to set a tray by the window, her steps short and precise. She said a few words, took a few gentle sliding paces backwards, then knelt down, bowed, and closed the door again. As she disappeared from view, 
Rose saw her lowered eyelids flicker, and she was struck by the beauty of her brown kimono belted with an obi embroidered with pink peonies. The memory of her clear voice, each sentence ending on a clipped note, chiming in the air like a gong. Rose inspected the unfamiliar food, the teapot, the bowl of rice. Every movement she made felt like a desecration. Through the bare frame of the window, where a glass pane and its paper screen cover slid open, she could see the etched, trembling leaves of a maple tree and a more expansive vista beyond. There was a river, its banks teeming with wild grasses, and on either side of its pebbled bed were sandy pathways and more maples mingling with cherry trees. In midstream, amid a languid current, stood a grey heron. Fine weather clouds drifted overhead. Rose was struck by the force of the flowing water. Where am I? She wondered. And although she knew the city was Kyoto, the answer stole away from her like a shadow. That was gorgeous. Thank you so much, Felicite. Well, this, all, this really proves my point that you can put three French authors together, but you put their extracts back to back and they are completely different as each from as if from different planets. Um, we should explain the context of Rose's arrival in Kyoto. She is almost 40, I think, and her father, who she has never met, has died in Kyoto and his last wish is for her to travel to Japan and be looked after by his assistant, Paul, and go on a journey um, around some of his favorite places, a journey that he hopes, we assume, will be meaningful for her. And so the story unfolds and the connection between Paul, who is the window into this world, and Rose. Thinking about this idea about what comes first and your incredible evocation of what that looks like for you, this world of colour and sound and impressions. Did that character of Rose come to you first or is it more a sense of place? I know that you spent time in Kyoto. Were you th was it that that you felt? Where did this begin, this book? I don't remember. <laughs> That's the main problem. It's very difficult to remember how things were put together. I have difficulties to, 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 to even know what was first or not. But actually, this is not the very beginning of the novel. Because before each chapter, where we follow Rose on the path of her uh, dead father, uh, I wrote a little tale, a little legend in a Zen way or in a Japanese way in which uh, ancient uh, characters from ancient China or Japan are facing paradoxes. And uh, the little tank doesn't, doesn't solve them, but just expresses. These are made up, the little tanks. Completely tales. made wow, up. brilliant. I thought they were real. Ah, you thought they were real. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very happy because my, my Japanese translator as well, she, she thought I, I used uh, Japanese or Chinese history and, uh, and my knowledge of it, which is absolutely bad. And then, no, I, I made them up. And so I think it started with that. And then I had the, the feeling that I wanted to, to find a woman in Kyoto, and that was all I had, mm -hmm. this image. Mm. And the writing is very poetic and very spare. The language is very careful and there's nothing extra. How do you get to that? 
I had written previously two very lyrical novels in which I was using all the span of French language and with the pleasure to use everything I could use and with long sentences and a sense of poetry that was, yes, really lyrical. And maybe this is the lesson of Japan. Suddenly I felt the need to make it shorter, more sober, to have a, a sort of, um, of nudity in the prose. And that was the main pleasure in working uh, on that novel, to work, to carve the text more and more in order to try to remove everything <coughs> I could to get to very essential prose, which of course I didn't succeed, because when I read the extract, I would remove a few things more. <laughs> and no, I just have a remark to, to make because when listening to you, Felicity, thank you for your reading, uh, it reminded me how difficult for Alison Anderson, my translator, this, this, uh, these few paragraphs were because there are many Japanese uh, things in there. And the walls with sand finishes took us maybe 10 emails and pictures and uh, so it's, uh, I just wanted to honor the tr our translators because they are doing very hard work and it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a creative work as well and I admire them very much. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to open up to audience questions in a moment. If you have a question, no question is too big, as I think I have already demonstrated. No question is too small about any of the other author's work, about any ideas about your... We've got lots of lovers of literature and of French literature in the room, so if you have anything to share about your recent reading, we'd love to hear from you, any questions that you have. But first of all, I wanted to ask you a little more about this question of translation and in particular about where English fits into that, because you've all been translated into many languages. Is there something specific about a relationship with the translator into English that is different from other languages? It's always different. Uh, it's, it's, and it's, it fascinates me and in, in, it interests me a lot to see the difficulties that are... Pro that are Yes, proper to each language. For example, in English, the problem is most often conjugation, because we have more tenses and more uh, well in French. So to 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 convey the complexity of French conjugation is, is quite challenging for translator. And if it's uh, a sophisticated use of uh, conjugation in the French text, you have to find ways, but different ways in English to convey the refinement or the sophistication of the prose. So that's a very difficult of English, but you have others in, in other languages. Mm. Uh, sounds, uh, syntax, grammar, it's each time a very interesting e exchange with the translators. And I love to work with them. Jean-Baptiste, it must be very difficult for, for your translator, for all of your translators into English, because you all know English very well, which this must not be the case with every language that you're translated into. Um, well, I speak 15 languages. So <laughs> no. Um, well, no, it's a good thing because actually the translator has somebody to talk to and uh, sometimes it's very interesting to see. Sometimes mistakes are made because there is until you realize like, oh my God, I understand how he could have understood that. So you look at your own language in a different way. And uh, no, it's uh, it's uh, it's quite uh, it's great. I mean, it's uh, because it's a challenge, and I um, actually the only translator I have a relationship with is mine here, uh, you know, through Gaelic, and um, obviously because English is the only other language I speak than French. Um, so I I told him, look, don't stick too closely. Don't try to imitate the the original uh, text. Uh, because some lines, had I written them in English, I would have written them differently. So don't hesitate, something sounds better. What I want is the spirit of the original text and not the exact same word. So I don't care if something is, was green and becomes red because red sounds better, it, that kind of thing. Mm. It's a fun process. Would you allow that yeah. to pass, Antoine, that yeah. green yes. can become red? Yes, I think, I think a good translation must be a recreation, in fact. So it's not, 
the, the, the main question is not to translate exactly, is to, to recreate. It, there is a huge part of creation in a tr good translation. Insta instead of that, you could translate um, you could translate a book with the artificial intelligence. It's 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 very on the air on the moment with mm -hmm. the chat GPT, and uh, but there is a definitely a part of a recreation. It's another book. Mm. I fully agree with you. <laughs> mm. At last, again. Well, yeah, I agree. Uh, yeah. Back a translation is as much an act of creation or recreation as the text itself, a good translation. But it depends. Some authors want, you know, want that very same word and want you know, the, the translator to be uber faithful to the original mm -hmm. text, and <coughs> then it sounds translated. We don't want to sound tr translated, I guess. Mm -hmm. Ideally, you shouldn't feel that there's been a translation. And a good translator, I've been told, and I agree with that, is someone who is excellent is in is his own language. He, he or she can have weaknesses in the foreign language, but you have always resources or uh, possibilities to, to lighten that. But if you have a very deep control of your own language and of your literature, your own literature, you, you, you are doing a good job, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Any questions from the audience? If you have a question, please raise your hand. Um, we've got somebody waiting with a microphone so we can capture you. Yes, go ahead, capture you on our recording. Hi, welcome. Hi. Um, I was interested in your planning approach and uh, that you're Finally. a heavy planner. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I was got one. <laughs> vote, of, vote of confidence in planning. I was wondering if this is, comes from your screenwriting. I mean, I assume that that is storyboarded and planned to the nth degree. And is that because you had a, a natural affinity for it? or that it's been drummed into you? It was hammered into me f when I was a child by my father. So um, when I was 16, he said, if you want to say something, you have to plan. And then I studied, I w it was hammered into me by the school I went to in Paris. Wh what was your father's profession? He was into urban planning. Okay, ah, oh. okay. <laughs> uh, no, but there's this thing in France, I was asked that question, uh, are you more of a gardener type, type of writer or an architect type of writer and then I, I it was the first time I, I had I'd heard that question I didn't understand it immediately and then I thought oh okay they mean gardening is like you grow things and architect is planning but actually a good gardener plans things you have the best gardens in the world in the UK uh, and it doesn't happen because people throw seeds so it's it's I'm deeply, why do, would you have to plan a symphony? Why, if a painter doesn't just go, <laughs> he, does, he does sketches. Why do you have to plan everything, paintings, buildings, symphonies, and why is, would literature be apart from, from that? So it's, it's a very deep belief uh, for me that there should be planning. And planning, it does not mean you won't be able to improvise. Planning is, the, uh, is where invention will be able to grow. So you plan, and then you add flourishes, and you might change things. It's not, it's not um, uh, shackles. It's meant to make you free. That's a very strong, strong Sorry. defense of planning. No, it's excellent. I was also reminded of, I can't remember if I am correctly recalling the name of this film. But there's a film called, I think it's called Nonfiction in English, it's a French film with Juliette Binoche, and it has a character of a novelist in it who is writing autofiction. And he, he's a comic character, it's beautifully played, but he's a complete idiot. And he just thinks he can just write, 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 autofiction, autofiction, autofiction. And it's the absolute opposite of what you're talking about. And I do think that that is a, a parody of a certain kind of writer, not necessarily French, but very common in French writing. Yeah. Yes, I think I think the auto the autofiction, it's um, it's too easy. You you have the feeling of everything uh, happening in your life could be a chapter of a book, could be very very interesting, and in fact, not. But it's true that French literature no. is a lot of that. It's very true. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's terrible, but no. 
mainly the life is very boring. <laughs> and uh, if, if you tell your, your, your life or your days or your week, I'm not so sure you're, you can get some reader. Maybe you could lost your wife or <laughs> your <laughs> friends. <laughs> but, well, you know, also fiction, it's, 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 uh, it's a fake mirror. Yeah. Okay, vote for planning, vote against autofiction. We're decided. Any other questions in the room? Don't be shy. Yes, go ahead. Um, question for Muriel Barberi, for whom I'm a massive, massive fan, by the way, ever since The Elegance of the Hedgehog. But I read the two Kyoto novels, I think, in the wrong order, because I read them in French, so L'Art du Ferveur and then uh, Une Rose Simple. And I just wondered if um, you knew already when you were writing A Single Rose that you were going to go back in time, sorry to be a spoiler alert there. <laughs> no, it's not a spoiler. <laughs> no, I didn't know, because otherwise I would have done that in the right order. <laughs> and I didn't, and uh, my, yeah, my mistake. No, I didn't know that. When I finished uh, Senior Rose, I thought I would do something completely different. And then the characters of the novel, I, I was missing them very much. So I decided to explore the main one of the main characters of Rose, but he's not here because he's dead, the father. And then I had to go back in time to figure out who he was. So my apologies, because you have to read in the wrong order. <laughs> it's my entire fault. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And very as much. I was saying, and, and on this, uh, it's not that I disagree with uh, Jean-Baptiste, that we are all different and I find it very interesting each time to see other ways of creating because it, I think it's each time very sing peculiar and, and fascinating. Uh, I, I never plan anything, never, so I've been surprised myself. Have you read them in French? Uh, I read them in French, yes, I'm not French, but I read them in French. And, and interestingly, um, The Elegance of the Hedgehog, which I've read, believe it or not, five times. <laughs> I just love that book. Um, I find the, um, the French version, I notice the, the um, emotion and the relationships and the sadness. And in the English version, I notice much more the comedy. So I don't, just, that's my take on translation. <laughs> yes, yes. Very interesting. I never heard that... Uh, that remark about the, the translation. I had many of them, but not that one. I will convey that to Alison. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Another question. Somebody twitching at the back, perhaps. Okay, don't be afraid to twitch at any time. I'm going to keep my <laughs> eyes open. I wanted to ask all of you about your recommendations of writers that you're reading at the moment, or maybe even something on television or film. Um, it could be French, it could be not French. Who is inspiring you at the moment who you enjoy to read? Or you can answer a different question, which is, do you read and or consume other culture when you are working? <laughs> because many writers do not. Antoine, thoughts? Well, um, I'm, uh, I'm a part of the many writers uh, who doesn't read a lot during the writing process. So I'm into the writing process for the moment. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm not, I'm not, not a very good reader uh, yeah, for the moment, but well, that was interesting what, you, what uh, the, the reader of Muriel said about the audience, because uh, the elegance of the edge, work, uh, it was, uh, See, seems to be sad in France, or maybe too sad in France, and, and with more humor in the uh, in UK. So that's very interesting. The and audience, you, you change yes. complete, ch the audience changed the book a little bit like our cover. Our French cover is very different from the, from the British cover. You know, it's the same book, but it's, it's, another, it's another way to see it. Maybe it's because there is no imparfait du subjonctif in English. <laughs> and it was lost in translation and then it became more sparkling, more... Ah, oh, maybe, yeah. yes. Who knows? Could be that, <laughs> yes. But maybe it's also, it's the reader, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> because I completely agree with your interpretation of, of the elegance of the hedgehog and I think it happens in many novels, this idea that English 
makes you feel differently than if you read it in, in the French. And I think maybe it's because readers read themselves But in a book. I wonder if it's not because each language uh, brings with it all the history of the culture that he, he's, uh, well, I don't know how to articulate in English, but I think you get the idea. And as, as uh, novelists or writers, I think we feel that. We think that using language, we are doing, we are writing texts that are indeed more intelligent than we are, because we are using a language that, uh, in which flows the wisdom and the knowledge of all our culture. So maybe that explains uh, mm. why first texts are more intelligent than authors. And second, why in each language, of course, it is something different that we, uh, that we merge from the text. Mm. Jean-Baptiste, are you an author who does not read whilst you are creating? I, I, yeah, because I'm worried I'm going to sponge off somebody else's style. So I, r I actually read English books when I write. Uh, I usually read English books anyway, but like one English one book in English, one book in French. And uh, but when I write, I stick uh, to English books so that I'm not tempted to absorb or mimic unconsciously a style. Mm -hmm. And I love Ted Lasso and Succession. Ah, oh, good answer. Yeah, have you watched the latest Succession? Of course I have. Okay, I watched it yesterday. Yeah, it's phenomenal. You know, I'm normal. Yeah. <laughs> Muriel, how about you? Do you uh, read well, I'm not as uh, part of I'm your I'm not process? writing at the moment, so I'm reading, or I'm starting to write. There is a writer I would very much like to recommend to you, because uh, and, and he's translated into English, so you can read it both in French and in English. And it happens to be a very good friend, but I admired him as a writer before he became a friend. And he's the one reading what I'm writing, and opposite is true. We read each other and we talk about what we are writing in complete trust. And it's Jean-Baptiste Delamo. I don't know if his name is familiar to you. Jean-Baptiste Delamo is translated by Fitzcarraldo, I think. Mm -hmm. It's uh, edited, uh, published by <coughs> Fitzcarraldo. And he's a great writer. I think he's one of the best uh, French writers uh, at the moment. Okay. I'm going to give a final shout. Oh, yes, please. Can we have a microphone to this gentleman? Welcome. Um, thank you. Um, I have often wondered if uh, Antoine had bumped into Patrick Modiano um, <laughs> walking in the street. Well, thank you for the, that lovely question. Uh, I've met Patrick Bogano in the street once, yeah, many years ago, and uh, it was so. Mm, it was like in a dream, you know. He was passing just just in front of me, and uh, I've I, I've left the moment, you know. Until the end of that moment, I didn't want to bother him to ask him to to tell him, oh, I love your book and. He, I saw him just at, just disappeared at the end of the street. It was like uh, like a, a dreamy moment, yes. Mm. And uh, he he does the same walk in the in the Jardin de Luxembourg. Yeah, mm. I've just changed the hour in the red notebook, <laughs> not to um, for him not to be disturbed. <laughs> I must ask you, Antoine, have you also crossed paths with your fan, Queen Camilla? Yes. <laughs> I don't know if people know that, that uh, Antoine's book was included on a famous list of books recommended by Camilla, then the royal consort, now queen, uh, as recommended COVID-19 pandemic reading, um, and the only French book on the list. Yes, it was the, the Red Knot book, yes. Uh, well, I was, I was first very surprised that, that but I mean it's a great honor it's a, it's a great privilege to be the, the only the only French uh, author <coughs> and, and, and to have my book in that list and so yes I've met her at Clarence House after the third or fourth lockdown yes yes so it takes time and uh, that was a very very good very charming moment and uh, we, we I have letters from her, and uh, and yeah, uh, she 
get mine too. I was I was supposed to see her at, at Versailles, but the President Macron has problem with the strike. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, he he completely spoiled my dinner. <laughs> I hope the king and, the, and Queen Camilla will be back one day in Paris. <laughs> I'm sure they will. That's true. I was <laughs> supposed to be there. Yes. Yeah. I have the invitation <laughs> on my desk. We'll make sure it happens, Antoine. Well, on that note of royal benediction, um, oh, we've got one more question? Yeah, let's have the question before we finish. I want to say thank you to the three of you. Um, there's this burning question in my mind, and I wonder if any of you ever considered writing a book under a nom de plume, or would ever do it, just for the fun of it, of being more like a spy, like a writer, like a spy writer? Well, yeah, of course, because famously, J.K. Rowling has <laughs> Well, the thing this. is, you <laughs> work hard to establish your name, and when it starts to mean something, I mean, I, I'm not in a hurry to... Uh, just changed my name because I'm trying to capitalize on what I've done so far. But indeed, intellectually, I've wondered if you, you know, when you start reaching a certain level of success, what I'm wondering is if I sent a book with a, another name to a publisher, not knowing, you know, what I, who wouldn't know what I'd done before, would it be accepted? I, I would love to see that, uh, but I'm not going to risk it now. <laughs> Muriel, are you tempted? Well, you, you're talking about my dream. Because actually, if I had known that the Egans of the Hedgehog would be so successful when I saw that only a few copies would be sold, uh, I would have done it under another name and I would have been like Elena Ferrante, I think, uh, being completely uh, invisible. But it's too late. I've just thought maybe you are Elena Ferrante. <laughs> 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 Antoine, no other. Not well, a plume for you. I he can't. He's favorite of the queen. He's not <laughs> going to change his name. He's not, his invitation is not going to be valid anymore. Yeah, but maybe that's a millstone around his neck. <laughs> 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 well, well, I I had the temptation for uh, for the book called The Reader's Room, and uh, in fact, uh, now I have decided that uh, my my banker and uh, and my cat needs uh, food and uh, I need some money. So yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> your cat thanks you we're back back to the cat which we started with uh, thank you so much for your wonderful questions you have the opportunity to continue this conversation now with all of our our, our, our authors downstairs in the foyer lots of beautiful books uh, on sale and i really recommend definitely the trio as a minimum maybe double versions of the trio one for friends as well all authors will be available to sign. Uh, thank you so much to all of you. Please give a round of applause to Antoine Laram, Raphael Bernadette, and Jean-Baptiste.